Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to call this meeting of the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality to order. Today is Wednesday, January 24th, 2024. Time is 9.30 a.m. With us today are Commissioners Bobby Janeka and our General Counsel Mary Smith. And I understand that Commissioner Lindley is joining us virtually. Are you there, Commissioner? Morning, I am. I can see you and hear you. Good morning. Um, all right, let me run through the admonitions here. Um, for those who will be making presentations, please wait to begin your presentation until our general counsel or I have asked you to begin. Uh, we will inform speakers of their time limits uh, where any argument or discussion is allowed. Registration has now closed, but if you'd like to address the commission on a particular topic, please email agenda at tceq.texas.gov with your name, your affiliation, and the item that you'd like to speak to and we will do our best to accommodate that request. And with that, thanks everyone for being present today. And Ms. Smith, I'll ask you to please call the first item. Item number one is the consideration of the ALJ's proposal for decision and proposed order concerning the enforcement action against Corey Morrell. The order of presentation will be the ED, followed by the respondent, and then OPIC. Each party has five minutes unless extended by the commission and the ED may reserve time for rebuttal as the ED bears the burden of proof in this matter. And so we'll begin with the ED. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman. Uh, could you let me know when I hit the four minute mark? Thank you. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, General Counsel, Office of Public Interest Counsel. My name is William Hogan. I am a staff attorney with the Litigation Division, here today representing the Executive Director. With me today is Ms. Carolyn Kent, an Enforcement Coordinator from the Office of Compliance and Enforcement. We're here today in support of the ALJ's proposal for decision and proposed order as amended by the executive director's exceptions regarding the enforcement action against respondent Corey Morrell. Respondent owned and operated an unauthorized municipal solid waste disposal site near Cleburne, Texas. There's a single violation at issue in this case. Respondent caused, suffered, allowed, or permitted the disposal of MSW without authorization, specifically consisting of approximately 1,852 scrap tires. Satellite imagery admitted as evidence at hearing demonstrates that the tires had been on the property since November 2014, and they remained there through April 2021. This shows that respondent violated Title 30, Section 330.15a and c of the Texas Administrative Code. The ALJ found that the Executive Director met its burden in proving this violation. The Executive Director also provided evidence that the proposed administrative penalty for this matter was calculated fairly and in accordance with the TCEQ penalty policy. Respondents stipulated to this fact at hearing, and the ALJ found the executive director met its burden in this regard as well. The ALJ also found that the executive director proved that respondents should be ordered to take certain actions necessary to return to compliance with TCEQ rules. Respondent has argued that he did not cause the tires to be disposed of. He has not substantiated that claim with any evidence beyond his own testimony. But more importantly, the argument is immaterial. As the landowner at the time, he suffered, allowed, or permitted the disposal to occur, particularly given how long the tires remained on the property. Respondent has also claimed that TCEQ did not prove that the tires were in fact scrap tires. That claim is misplaced. The executive director asserted a violation for unauthorized disposal of MSW. The condition of the tires is not an element of such a violation. Instead, it requires a showing that the tires were discarded, including by abandonment on land. The evidence on the record incontrovertibly shows that these tires were abandoned and left on the ground at respondent's property for at least six years. The record does not include any objective evidence that respondent actually used these tires for any purpose. The ALJ did not find merit in any of respondent's arguments and recommended assessing the executive director's proposed penalty of $6,750 against him in full, as well as requiring him to complete the recommended corrective actions. The executive director submitted minor exceptions to the proposed decision, all of which the ALJ accepted. Respondent neither opposed those exceptions nor submitted exceptions of his own. Accordingly, we request the commission adopt the ALJ's proposed order as amended by the executive director's exceptions. Thank you, and we'd be happy to take any questions you have. Thank you, Mr. Hogan. I have none. Commissioner Lindley, any questions? No, thank you. Commissioner Janeka? None. All right, let's hear next from the respondent, Mr. Corey Morell. Mr. Morell, are you with us? Yes, I am. Great. Well, you're coming in loud and clear, and so the, the, I'll ask you to state your name again for the record, and then the floor is yours. 
Okay. Um, uh, please alert me also when I've reached the four minutes, uh, Mark. Uh, my name is uh, Corey Morell, and I'm the respondent in this uh, uh, proceeding. Thank you, Mr. Morell, and just go ahead when you're ready. We're ready for your presentation. Okay, I have a, just a few uh, points I would like to uh, uh, to go over. Um, first of all, um, the uh, the administrative law judge in this case made some profound uh, errors in her uh, uh, in her recommendation. Um, very quickly, I'd like to just point out um, in her recommendation she. Uh, states numerous times that Robert Lewis, who was the uh, expert um, provided uh, by TCEQ at the evidentiary hearing, uh, was the one who conducted the, the on-site investigation and was a first-hand witness uh, in these proceedings. Uh, that, is, that is not correct. Uh, Mr., uh, Mr. Lewis had nothing to do with these proceedings until he appeared at the evidentiary hearing. The actual field investigators from TCEQ were never called as witnesses. Uh, and she refers to Mr. Lewis as that first-hand witness numerous times in, in relying upon her recommendation. Um, uh, and there are, there are other numerous, there's too many of them to actually go over in the time limit allow, allowed, uh, but uh, she she was seemed to be profoundly confused about the facts in this case. So I would urge the commission to go over the record and, and read and, and see for themselves before relying on her recommendation. Uh, secondly, I would like to um, uh, point out that uh, that tires, uh, even scrap tires, are not municipal solid waste under the statute. A clear reading, of, a plain language reading of, of the, the statute regarding municipal solid waste does not mention scrap tires at all. Uh, and in, for, in support of that, I would point to the fact that the only uh, precedent that TCEQ uh, brought uh, to the hearing was a case I believe was from 2013. And they appear to be bootstrapping that case to fit this one. But that case from 2013, the only one that they could find is profoundly different from this case. In that case, the, the respondent was cited for uh, cut brush, uh, wooden pallets, and scrap tires. So we don't really know if he was cited for the, the actual municipal solid waste, which is the brush and the, and the, and the pallets, or the, the tires additionally. Second, that respondent in that case admitted to causing the tires to be placed on the property. He was wanting to use them for land reclamation projects he had uh, uh, ongoing. Uh, so he admitted to, to having the tires placed in his property. I did not. I at no, no time ever stated that I caused these tires to face my property, and I never wanted them. I was, in fact, the victim of a crime in this case when that when whoever this was dumped this truckload of tires on my property without my permission. It's just that after the fact, I tried to make the best of a bad situation. Um, uh, next, the, uh, uh, the uh, respondent in that case also uh, did not defend his position, a default judgment was entered. So it's reasonable to assume that had he appeared and, 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 and made a, an attempt to defend uh, the, the charges against him, perhaps it could have turned out differently. But my point is that case, which is not on point at all, is the only one that TCQ was able to find uh, that even remotely uh, fit my case. Um, so... Uh, as Mr. Hogan said, I was also going to point out that uh, uh, in their investigation, um, TCEQ failed uh, to conduct any uh, sort of evidentiary uh, gathering to indicate or to prove uh, that any of these tires even fit, fit the definition of a scrap tire. That's four minutes. Uh, okay. Um, and Mr. Morell, you have another a minute of time, so uh, feel free to use okay. that. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, where's my other? Well, I guess uh, uh, also the the TCQ was under notice that uh, uh, I was intending to use these tires for an alternative beneficial use project, and that is in the record. Uh, I communicated with them regarding that. I'd even been given advice on how to proceed. 
So we don't know, were the tires scrap tires or were they building material? And at what point did they change from one status to another? Um, there is nothing in the, in the rules regarding alternative benefits use projects that has any particular timelines or deadlines in place. So, so the fact that when I started or if I, that I never finished because I, I disassembled the fence and sold the property, it, that's all a gray area. So it was, it was never clear. But the point is, I tried to comply with the law. I tried to do what I was required to do under the rules, uh, as I've always done in my life. And, and uh, it, it apparently it's time. good enough. I'll just ask you to finish your thought, Mr. Morrell. Uh, anyway, it, 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 even though I attempted to do uh, uh, you know, what, what was right and comply with, with everything I was required to do, um, it, it apparently fell short. And the last, the last point I wanted to make is they're apparent, uh, I'm apparently also being required to um, get the disposal log from the uh, from that Star Tire Recycling that picked up the uh, the tires. Uh, I had been paying this this company thousands of dollars to pick up these tires, which is what I was trying to avoid all along. Um, and uh, I did get receipts. I did submit those receipts, um, but apparently uh, the enforcement division wants me to get a log from this company uh, and after numerous attempts to do so, um, the, they are uh, have refused and are not complying with my request, but they're not required to either. I'm just a private citizen asking a private company for uh, documentation that they have and they're under no obligation to give it to me. But TCEQ is going to penalize me for not getting this, this disposal log, which I, I don't have any power to get. And, and, I, and I believe that's just that it, 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 it defies common sense and uh, it's completely unfair. So um, I believe that's about all I had to say on that matter. Okay, thank you, Mr. Morrell. Um, I do have a question for you. So do I understand correctly that you tried on multiple occasions um, to get the tire disposer to, um, to provide you proof of where those tires went? That's correct. And did you do this by email or letter or phone call or? Uh, no, I called them a total of four times. Uh, and uh, the, the last time, the, the guy actually hung up on me. He said, I, I, some, some to the effect that I don't uh, have to give you any, any logs. This is your issue. Deal with it. And uh, that was the last time I spoke with him. But I, I called him a total of four times trying to get because I thought this, this was kind of low-hanging fruit. This is such an easy thing to get if I can just get this guy to scan and email me a copy of this log. At least I can get this part out of the way. Okay. I couldn't even get that. And I, I understand. Thank you, sir. I'd like to remind the commission that I think that information is not in the record, and, and so it's not anything that can be considered on this PFD. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Thank you again, Mr. Morrell. Uh, Commissioner Lindley, any questions or comments at this point? Commissioner Janeka. No, no, thank you. All right, let's hear next from OPIC. Ms. Mehta, good morning. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, General Counsel, and the Executive Director's Attorney and Staff. I'm Pranjal Mehta for the Office of Public Interest Counsel. OPIC supports the Administrative Law Judge's proposal for decision. OPIC agrees that the greater weight of evidence establishes that the tires at the site were scrap tires. OPIC also agrees with the ALJ's conclusion that the scrap tires on the site are MSW. OPIC finds that the ED established by a preponderance of the evidence that the respondent committed the alleged violation and the corrective actions are appropriate and necessary to address respondent violation. The record shows that the respondent did not dispute the administrative penalty amount for these reasons, OPIC recommends adoption of the ALJ's proposal for decision as amended by the ALJ's exception letter. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Mehta. I have none. Commissioner Lindley, any questions? Okay, seeing none from Commissioner Janeka. Uh, Mr. Hogan, you have one minute for rebuttal. Thank you, sir. Excuse me. You have two minutes and 12 seconds for rebuttal. Thank you. Commissioners, on the issue of who actually disposed of the tires, I would first reiterate that respondent's claim is legally immaterial. Even if we take him at his word that he did not initially cause the disposal, 
as the landowner, he still suffered, allowed, or permitted it to take place, particularly given the demonstrated lack of corrective action over the six years the tires were on the property. Regarding the issue of whether the tires qualify as scrap tires, whether they qualify as scrap tires under the definition of that term found in Chapter 330 or 328 is immaterial. The question relevant to the violation is not whether they were scrap tires, but whether they were municipal solid waste, and those two categories are not mutually exclusive. The investigator established at hearing that the tires at issue qualify as MSW, and there is agency precedent that supports this. Whatever condition the tires were in, respondents still left them in a pile on his property for six years, exposing the area to potential harm from vectors and from fire hazards. That indicates that they were discarded, meaning those tires were municipal solid waste. Regarding how the tires qualify as municipal solid waste, under Chapter 330, municipal solid waste includes all other solid waste other than industrial solid waste. It is undisputed that the tires are not industrial solid waste. The definition of solid waste includes other discarded material. Finally, the definition of discard is to abandon a material and not use, reuse, reclaim, or recycle it. The evidence shows that the tires were left untouched for at least six years and not used, reused, reclaimed, or recycled. Thus, they were discarded. This makes them solid waste, and because they are not industrial solid waste, they are municipal solid waste. Regarding the beneficial reuse project that Respondent claimed, when Respondent first raised that claim to the investigator, she asked him to provide photos to document his project. He did not provide any. To this day, the executive director is still waiting to see evidence that Respondent ever made any serious effort to beneficially reuse the tires. To the contrary, what we have seen is satellite imagery that shows no sign of any beneficial reuse of the tires. The photographic evidence on the record speaks for itself. With that, I'll take any questions you may have. Thank you. I have none. Commissioner Lindley, any questions? Commissioner Janeka. All right, seeing none. Um, colleagues, um, based on the record and Mr. Morell's argu argument this morning, um, my review of the matter, I do not see a basis to change any of the findings of fact or conclusions of law other than a, a correction to a citation and conclusion of law number six. And so pending your thoughts, I believe I'm ready to adopt the proposed order with the exceptions that were um, accepted by the ALJ. I'm in agreement. I'm as well. Sounds like we're ready for a, a motion. I, I can attempt a motion then. Um, I move that we adopt the administrative law judge's proposed order as modified by the ED's exemption, exception and recommended by the administrative law judge in her reply letter dated November 27, 2023, with the following additional modification. In conclusion of law number six, we revise the statutory citation to Texas Health and Safety Code section 361.003, uh, to Texas Health and Safety Code section 361.003, uh, subsection 20, I guess is the best way to say that, to reflect the correct subsection reference for the definition of municipal solid waste. I second the motion. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Ms. Smith, when you're ready, please call the next item. Item number two is the consideration of the application by Lyondell Chemical Company for a major amendment with renewal of TIPTI's permit number WQ00029270001. The parties have been notified that the commissioners will not take oral argument but may ask questions, and those who have signed in will be noted for the record. So, colleagues, we have a single requester on this item. Mr. Stewart owns properties that are in proximity to the facility or the discharge point or the discharge route. The applicant has argued that Mr. Stewart's concerns are not reasonably related to the authorization that it seeks, uh, pointing to silt and other material that's deposited in Bear Lake. 
Um, but I read his concerns as being broader than that. He references concerns about metals and other pollutants, about water quality generally, and about health impacts. So um, I agree with the executive director and the Office of Public Interest Council that Mr. Stewart is an affected person, and I would refer his case to SOA on whether the permit complies with TCEQ's anti-degradation policy and whether the draft permit is protective of water quality, of human health, and of the use and enjoyment of the requester's property. And I think on this one, we should also allow 180 days uh, for the hearing. Mr. Lindley, your thoughts? I'm in complete agreement. I'm as well, uh, and can provide a motion. Can't Great. That. I move that we grant the hearing request of Douglas R. Stewart Refer the application to SOA for a contested case hearing on the following issues. A, whether the draft permit complies with TCQ's anti-degradation policy pursuant to 30 Texas Administrative Code Section 307.5. And B, whether the draft permit is protective of water quality, including the protection of human health, existing uses of the receiving waters, and use and enjoyment of requesters' properties in accordance with applicable regulations, including the Texas Surface Water Quality Standards and 30 Texas Administrative Code Chapter 307. and that we set a hearing duration of 180 days from the date of the preliminary hearing until the proposal for decision is issued. A second. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Ms. Smith, when you're ready, please call the next item. Item number three is the consideration for adoption of amendments to the air quality standard permit for concrete batch plants. The executive director's staff is here to present this item. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners, general counsel, and public interest counsel. On behalf of the executive director, I'm Michael Wilhoyt with the Air Permits Division. With me is Bonnie Everidge of the Air Permits Division, and we have Burl Thatcher with the Office of Air attending virtually. Also with us is Booker Harrison with the Environmental Law Division. For your consideration today is the adoption of the amended air quality standard permit for concrete batch plants authorized under Texas Health and Safety Code section 382.05195 and Title 30 Texas Administrative Code chapter 116 subchapter F. The amendments incorporate the results of an updated air quality analysis that was conducted to address public concern about potential health impacts of concrete batch plants registered under the standard permit. Notice of the proposed amendments was published in the April 14, 2023 issue of the Texas Register. A public meeting was held on May 18, 2023, and the public comment period ended at midnight on June 14, 2023. The rule team received a wide range of public comments. In response, several substantive changes have been made to the standard permit being considered for adoption. These changes include revisions to differentiate central mix plants from truck mix plants, the addition of cement and fly ash storage silos as structures to be considered in the definition of setback distance, changes to maximum hourly and annual production rates for specialty concrete plants that meet an increased setback distance, a limitation on the total surface area of stockpiles, changes to make permit language regarding public works projects consistent with commission rules, the addition of record keeping requirements relating to the washing of sand or aggregate materials and manufacturer specifications for stationary engines. The addition of a requirement that dust suppression controls be maintained in good working order and the addition of a reference to Commission Rule 30 TAC 101.4 prohibiting nuisance conditions. In conclusion, staff respectfully recommends adoption 
of this amended standard permit. Additionally, staff requests authorization to make non-substantive revisions necessary to comply with Texas Register publication requirements. Thank you. We are available to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Will Hoyt. I have none. Commissioner Lindley, any questions? No, thank you. Commissioner Janeka. Ms. Smith, has anybody signed in to speak on this item? We have several people who signed in but indicated that they don't wish to address the commission and their presence will be noted for the record. Great. And Mr. Wayne, good morning. Hey, uh, good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, General Counsel, and the Executive Directors, Attorneys, and Staff. For the record, I'm Sheldon Wayne and I'm here on behalf of OPIC. Our office participated in and supports the non rule amendment to the standard permit for concrete batch plants. We applaud the commission and the executive director, including their staff, for voluntarily initiating this process and for the hard work that went into these amendments. We recognize that the amendments incorporate an updated air quality analysis conducted by TCEQ to address public concern about potential health impacts of concrete batch plants registered under the standard permit, including concerns about crystal and silica emissions. The results of this air quality analysis drove numerous changes to the standard permit that work to ensure the permit is protective of the health and the environment and strengthen and renew the public's trust in the concrete batch plant standard permit. We note that specific changes were also made to address nuisance conditions that have been associated with the operation of some of these plants, including increased setback distances, new production limits, and requirements to control and minimize dust. In sum, OPIC supports the adoption of the amended standard permit for concrete batch plants as recommended by the executive director. Thank you, and I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Wayne. Um, well, colleagues, let me begin by saying I really appreciate the robust public participation on this item. Um, I greatly appreciate the staff's thoughtful response to comments. Um, I think we may find ourselves uh, revising this authorization once again when the new PM NACS arrives. Um, I really appreciate Mr. Wayne pointing out that this effort was a voluntary effort. Um, I also want to thank the executive director's staff for, um, for not waiting for the new PM NACs um, and not tying this effort to something beyond our control. Um, and colleagues, pending your thoughts, I think I'm ready to move forward with adoption. All well said. I have nothing to add. Likewise. I believe we're ready for a motion. I would move then that we adopt the amendments to the air quality standard permit for concrete batch plants as recommended by the executive director and issue the executive director proposed order. I second the motion. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Ms. Smith, when you're ready, please call the next item. Item number four is the consideration for publication and solicitation of public comment on two draft total maximum daily loads for indicator bacteria in Big Creek in the Brazos River Basin. The executive director's staff is here to present this item. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Chairman, Commissioners, General Counsel, and Public Interest Counsel. For the record, I am Nicole Hall with the Water Quality Planning Division in the Office of Water. With me today are Wyatt Eason with the Total Maximum Daily Load Program and Aubrey Pawelka with the Environmental Law Division. Today, the Executive Director is requesting the release of public comment of two total maximum daily loads for indicator bacteria in Big Creek. The TMDLs cover two assessment units in one water body within Fort Bend County. A stakeholder group was formed with balanced representation of all interested parties and was tasked with providing input on the TMDL document. The development of this document included an active public participation effort and balanced stakeholder group coordinated by TCQ and the Houston Galveston Area Council. The success of this project is due to the collaborative efforts of the individuals and organizations that put in the time to develop this document to improve water quality in their community. The executive director respectfully requests approval to publish the total maximum daily loads for public comment. Permission is also requested to make non-substantive and clerical corrections if needed before providing the documents for public notice. Thank you, and we are available to answer any questions that you have. 
Thank you, Ms. Hall. I have none. Commissioner Lindley, any questions? No, thank you. Commissioner Janeka. No, thank you. Ms. Smith, has anybody signed in to speak? No one has signed in on this one. Mr. Arthur. Good morning, Chairman and Commissioner. For the record, I'm Garrett Arthur, TCQ Public Interest Council. OPIC supports approval to publish and solicit public comment on two draft TMDLs for indicator bacteria in Big Creek of the Brazos River Basin in Fort Bend County. Thank you, Mr. Arthur. <clears throat> um, colleagues, I appreciate the stakeholders' um, early input on this and the Houston-Galveston Area Council for their help in facilitating public participation and developing these proposed TMDLs. I'm ready to put them out for comment. Agreed. Likewise, I move that we adopt the amendments to the air quality, <coughs> sorry, uh, I move that we approve the publication and solicitation of public comment on the two draft total maximum daily loads for indicator bacteria in Big Creek of the Brazos River Basin in Fort Bend County as recommended by the executive director. A second. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Ms. Smith, please call the next item. Item number five is the consideration for approval to publish and solicit public comment on two draft total maximum daily loads for indicator bacteria in the Oyster Creek watershed of the San Jacinto Brazos Coastal Basin. The executive director's staff is here to present this one. Deja vu. Good morning again. Good morning. Uh, Chairman, Commissioners, General Counsel, and Public Interest Counsel. For the record, I am Nicole Hall with the Water Quality Plan Division and the Office of Water. With me today are Wyatt Eason with the Total Maximum Daily Load Program and Aubrey Pawelka with the Environmental Law Division. Today, the Executive Director is requesting the release for public comment of two total maximum daily loads for indicator bacteria in Oyster Creek. The TMDLs cover two assessment units and two segments within Brazoria and Fort Bend counties. A stakeholder group was formed with balanced representation of all interested parties and was tasked with providing input on the TMDL document. The development of this document included an active public participation effort and balanced stakeholder group coordinated by TCEQ and the Houston Galveston Area Council. The success of this project is due to the collaborative effort of the individuals and organizations that put in the time to develop this document to improve water quality in their community. The executive director respectfully requests approval to publish the total maximum daily loads for public comment. Permission is also requested to make non-substantive and clerical corrections if needed before providing the documents for public notice. Thank you, and we are available to answer any questions that you have. Thank you again, Ms. Hall. I have none. Commissioner Lindley, any questions? Commissioner Janeka. No one signed in. You were anticipating that. <laughs> Mr. Arthur, your thoughts? OPIC supports approval to publish and solicit public comment on two draft TMDLs for indicator bacteria in the Oyster Creek watershed, of the San Jacinto Brazos Coastal Basin, and Brazoria and Fort Bend counties. Thank you, Mr. Arthur. Well, I want to again thank our stakeholders, the Houston Galveston Area Council, and of course our outstanding staff and colleagues. I'm ready to put this out for comment. Agreed. I would move that we approve the publication of and solicitation of public comment on two draft total maximum daily loads for indicator bacteria in the Oyster Creek watershed of the San Jacinto Brazos Coastal Basin in Brazoria and Fort Bend counties as recommended by the executive director. I second the motion. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Commissioner Janek, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Okay. Apologies. Aye. There we go. go. Um, it's unanimous. The motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Smith. When you're ready, uh, please call the next items. That takes us to our enforcement docket. Those are items six through 20, and the executive director staff is here to present these matters. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, General Counsel, and Public Interest Counsel. For the record, my name is Michael Parrish of the Enforcement Division. And with me today are Amy Sedemeyer, also of the Enforcement Division, and Gitanjali Yadav of the Litigation Division, representing the executive director. 
Pending before you are new business items 6 through 20. The total assessed administrative penalties are $403,044 with $23,435 deferred, $176,788 applied toward supplemental environmental projects, and $202,821 to the general revenue. We respectfully request approval of these items and are available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Parrish. I have none. Commissioner Lindley? Seeing none. Commissioner Janeka? No questions. Thank you. Ms. Smith? Uh, we have individuals signed in on 6, 16, and 19 who are available to answer questions if the commission has any, but um, and their presence will be noted for the record. Thank you. Mr. Arthur? OPIC supports adoption of these enforcement owners as recommended by ED staff. Colleagues, I agree with that. I'm ready to move forward. I move that we adopt items 6 through 20 as recommended today by the executive director. A second. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Ms. Smith, please call the next item. Item 21 is the consideration of the monthly enforcement report and the executive director's staff is also here to present this matter. Good morning again. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, General Counsel, and Public Interest Counsel. For the record, I am Amy Sotomayor of the Enforcement Division and with me are Michael Parrish of the Enforcement Division and Katanjali Yadav of the Litigation Division. We are here to present the monthly enforcement report for fiscal year 2024 through November. There were 158 effective administrative orders issued, and of those, 23 contained supplemental environmental projects. These orders assessed a total of $3,639,547 with a payable amount of $1,231,527. $2,226,889 are to be paid towards supplemental environmental projects. 3,364 notices of violation have been issued through either our field offices or review of self-reported data in our central office, and 419 enforcement action referrals have been received. There are 2,624 pending administrative orders with 1,524 cases that are on the backlog. 180 cases are pending at the Attorney General's office for representation in district court, and two judgments have been issued. 1,963 cases are being tracked for compliance. With commission approval, I would like to provide additional detail and a brief presentation on the backlog of cases. That would be great. Thank you. Okay. Megan will get us up and running here in a minute. I will go ahead. Okay. As of today, we have a total of 2,588 orders in the development process. Of note, this number represents a decrease in the total number of pending administrative orders reported in the monthly report to you today. Within the division, we continue to focus on our oldest cases first. Currently, less than 7% of our total volume of cases are greater than two years. We have stabilized our workforce, and we are continuing to develop and train our newest employees. We would expect positive reduction in cases to begin in the upcoming months. We will also continue to review and refine processes to increase our productivity and efficiency within the division. Um, this graphic represents the enforcement pending backlog. These are the cases that have been in-house for greater than 180 days with no initial mail out. Although this number continues to increase, we do anticipate this number to plateau in the upcoming months and they begin to, begin to decrease with the implementation of se section specific plans to reduce and el eliminate overall backlog. Next slide, please. This graphic represents the backlog cases and enforcement that are in proposed status that have been in-house greater than 550 days. This number is starting to trend down, and we would expect that trend to continue as we prioritize our oldest cases first. Next slide, please. This graphic represents the number of backlog cases in the litigation division. This number has trended upwards slightly as referrals to the litigation division have increased in recent months. Thank you, and we're available to answer any questions you may have. Let me ask you this, just 
in a nutshell, what what is the view of OCE of sort of the, the heart of the problem? Or maybe there's more than one um, piece of that. But what what is OCE's view of the problem? And um, if you could speak briefly to what OCE is doing to address it. Yes, absolutely. Um, so certainly the vacancies that we've had over the last couple of years have impacted our ability to efficiently move cases through this process. Um, so now that we are stabilized in that and I'm happy to report we, we made a big hire, we have um, less than seven vacancies in the entire division. Um, and so we're hopeful that we will start making more progress now um, as we are fully staffed and, and training up. Um, the process itself lends itself to a prolonged, um, I hate to use the word process again, but process. It just, it's a long process. And so we're really digging into that and trying to find ways to um, eliminate redundancies in that. Um, and then also just engaging with our respondents. Um, a lot of times respondents will want to ask questions or provide additional information to us that requires us to go back and forth with them in that in that proposed period. Um, and so that can take some time. Um, we can have cases go on for several months while we're in negotiation with those um, respondents. Okay, thank you, Ms. Sedemeyer. And, and that comports with my view of it also. I didn't want to ask you a leading question, but you know, certainly the vacancies that we've had until fairly recently um, have been a challenge and also the, the tenure of the, the new employees. They just don't have the experience to move the docket um, as fast. But um, I think that satisfies my questions for now. Thank you for that. Commissioner Lindley, do you have any questions? Um, I don't. Thank you, uh, Amy. Commissioner Janeka. I, I appreciate the, the presentation, the discussion. I certainly agree with your questions and point you made, Chairman. Uh, and I'll reiterate the piece about the tenure impact. I, I, I strongly agree that it will be slow going for us to expect to see changes and uh, progress, signs of progress in, in our efforts internally, partly as a simple factor that there's now significantly less experience in that section of our agency, that part of our agency. And uh, I want to also acknowledge what I think is a very positive change that our agency made in its process prior to that, that I also think is a factor that led into so, some of the some of the vacancies that we had to work very hard to, to fill and that's brought about a different tenure, average tenure of that part of our agency. That was the, the good decision that we made to consolidate our staff's purview, our efforts of the enforcement, the compliance and enforcement process from start to finish where previously we had supported a very distinct break at our agreed order process, where, where matters will come to our commission, we'll, we'll take our action and decision on them. Staff will change hands at that point. In the past, the, a different set of staff would take it, and, and I agree where we looked internally much more closely that there were some opportunities to improve our process by giving staff the chance to work the, the compliance issue from very start to very end of the process, but that translates to a I think, an increase in workload, an increase in complexity and difficulty for, for all staff at all levels of the agency. And frankly, I think the some of the staff departures and the movement internal in our agency to some other state agencies that followed, that that change of process, in my opinion, reflected the, the simple fact that change, change is uncomfortable. It's often unwelcome. It, it led to uh, some movement within our agency that, that we've gotten an opportunity now. We brought a lot of new staff in, and I'm, I'm confident that the, the section plan and the, the division has put forward a thoughtful plan that hopefully will lead to a real buy-in in this new culture in taking responsibility of this process from start to finish. It adds a lot of work to our staff's plate. And, and I wanted to acknowledge that and just um, thank the staff who are, who are now in that, uh, that pocket of our agency. I, I really want to commend them on this chapter of focusing very intently on a clear uh, clear backlog goal. I think there's a lot of other more complicated factors and pieces moving in the background, but thank you for highlighting it and, and uh, thank you, staff. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Ms. Smith, has anybody signed in to speak on this item? No one has signed in. Mr. Arthur. Elpic has no comment except to say that we appreciate the report and the insight that was just shared. Thank you. And uh, colleagues, no action is necessary on this item.
So um, thank you again, Ms. Sedemeyer and team. And Ms. Smith, I'll ask you when you're ready to please call the next item. Item 22 is the consideration of the adoption of amendments to 30 Texas Administrative Code Chapter 334 regarding underground and above ground storage tanks. And the Executive Director's staff is here to present this item. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners, General Counsel, and Public Interest Counsel. On behalf of the Executive Director, I'm Zachary King with the Program Support and Environmental Assistance Division. With me today is Cameron Puckett, staff attorney with the litigation division, and Elizabeth Vanderwerken with the program support and environmental assistance division. This adopted rulemaking would amend 30 tax section 334-48C to remove the requirement for all retail service stations to conduct inventory control procedures. This change does not remove the requirement for inventory control to be performed as a necessary component of a release detection method selected under 30 tax section 334 50D4, which is the combination of inventory control plus automatic tank gauging, and 30 tax section 334-50D9, which is the combination of inventory control plus statistical inventory reconciliation. The proposed rules were published in the September 22nd, 2023 issue of the Texas Register. A public hearing was held on October 19th, 2023. The public comment period closed on October 23rd, 2023. The rule team received one public comment during the public hearing in support of the amendment. No comments were received in opposition to the amendment and no comments were received that suggested changes to the amendment. In conclusion, staff respectfully recommends adoption of this rulemaking to chapter 334. Additionally, staff requests authorization to make non-substantive revisions necessary to comply with Texas Register requirements. Thank you, and we are available to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. King. I have none. Commissioner Lindley? No, thank you. Commissioner Janeka? <clears throat> Thanks. Ms. Smith, is anyone signed in to speak? No one is signed in on this. Mr. Martinez, good morning. Good morning, Chairman. Commissioners, General Counsel, and Executive Director, my name is Eli Martinez, and I'm with the Office of Public Interest Counsel for the record. Our office reviewed this proposed rulemaking package and we support its adoption. The public interest is served by preventing certain retail, retail um, facilities from using outdated or redundant processes when more current technology is available and this uh, effort effectuates that but goes no further than necessary. We just heard in the monthly uh, enforcement report that redundancies can impact efficiency and so we're happy to support an effort like this that makes the process a little bit um, more efficient and easier for a retail community to be able to keep up with. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Um, colleagues, my analysis tracks Mr. Martinez's analysis, so I'm not going to repeat it, but I am ready to adopt these amendments. Agreed. I would move that we approve the adoption of amendments to 30 Texas Administrative Code, Section 334.48, as recommended by the Executive Director. I second the motion. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Aye. Oh, it carried without you, technically, Commissioner Lindley, but uh, but now it carries unanimously. I'm sorry to, to uh, get in front of you there. Um, thank you again, Ms. Smith. When you're ready, please call the next items. That takes us to items 23 through 26, which are the quadrennial rule reviews for 30 Texas Administrative Code chapters 112, 293, 323, and 351. The executive director staff is here to present these matters. Good morning. 
Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, General Counsel, and Public Interest Counsel. On behalf of the Executive Director, I am Gwen Rico with the General Law Division. Pending before your items 23 through 26, the adopted rule reviews of 30 Texas Administrative Code Chapter 112, Control of Air Pollution from Sulfur Compounds, Chapter 293, Water Districts, Chapter 323, Water Disposal Approvals, and Chapter 351, Regionalization. As required by Texas Government Code Section 2001.039, Executive Director's staff conducted a rule review of these chapters to determine if the need for the rules within these chapters continue to exist. The proposed notices for the reviews of chapters 323 and 351 were published in the July 14th, 2023 issue of the Texas Register, and the proposed notices for the reviews of chapters 112 and 293 were published in the July 28th, 2023 issue of the Texas Register with 30-day comment periods. No comments were received for these rule reviews. Based on the review of these chapters, the executive director has determined that the reasons for the rules in chapters 112, 293, 323, and 351 continue to exist and changes to the rules identified as part of this rule review process will be addressed in a separate rulemaking action in accordance with the Texas Administrative Procedure Act. In conclusion, we respectfully recommend approval of the adoption of the rule reviews of chapters 112, 293, 323, and 351. Additionally, staff requests authorization to make non-substantive revisions necessary to comply with Texas Register requirements. Thank you. The project managers and staff attorneys assigned to these chapters are here to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Rico. I have none. Commissioner Lindley, any questions? No. Commissioner Janeka. Uh, thank you, Ms. Rico. I, I don't have questions. I, I did want to highlight one, one piece of this item. Uh, Ms. Rico mentioned changes uh, that, that staff found uh, perhaps being addressed in future rulemakings. I wanted to voice affirmatively, I do not believe it is worth our, our staff's efforts and, and energy to try to find and address some of the obsolete rules that our staff review found that would require us to submit a SIP revision or some other uh, acknowledgement with obligations from the federal government just because past, uh, past obligations our agency continues under implicate those obsolete rules. Uh, I, I don't believe it's a worthwhile expenditure of effort. I think it's good to have our rules simple and current and up to date, but if any members of the public are very closely watching and wondering why we're not sharing removal of references to the former Texas Air Control Board in our rules, I, I think it's a great reason that we're not at this time uh, for what it's worth. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Ms. Smith, is anybody signed in to speak on this item? Uh, no one signed in. Mr. Arthur. OPEC agrees that the reasons for initially adopting the Chapter 112, 293, 323, and 351 rules continue to exist, and we support readoption of the rules in each of these chapters. Thank you, Mr. Arthur. I, I do, too. I'd also just repeat that there are no comments on these items, and to the extent that we, had, we did identify and we have identified some redundant provisions, we'll handle those at the appropriate time. So, uh, colleagues, I'm certainly ready to move forward. Commissioner Lindley? The agreement, Commissioner Janeka. I move that we adopt the rule reviews and readopt the rules in 30 Texas Administrative Code chapters 112, 293, 323, and 351 without amendment as recommended by the Executive Director. The Commission further directs the ED to develop a timeline to initiate a SIP amendment to remove 30 Texas Administrative Code section 112.8b and to correct outdated references in chapter 112. A second. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Ms. Smith, please call the next items. Items 27 through 30 are for closed session, but the commission will not be meeting in closed session today. The time is 1024 AM. We are adjourned.